Hello and welcome to the Football Fill-In. I'm not Ben Foster again, I'm Mark Goldbridge, but we've got a banging show for you. We're talking about this. Bottle jobs, Arsenal, Spurs, Frank Lampard and also Southampton going down like the quality of refereeing in the Premier League this week. This is the Football Fill-In. Let's do it. Welcome to the Football Fill-In, I'm Mark Goldbridge and we're going to talk about all the Premier League action but before we get into that, no Ben Foster this week, he's still doing his tour for his penalty save against Notts County, we're thinking he might be back for Christmas but joining me I've got the two W's, we've got Will, how we doing? Hello mate, you okay? And we've got Watto as well, talking about Morning. goalkeepers, right, good, good, well we want, we're talking about goalkeepers, we're going to talk about Ramsdale in a minute but what a weekend it's been in the Premier League. We're going to start off at the top. Normally, we're like, well, you know, but it's Arsenal. Have they bottled it this weekend? 2-0 up again, but it ain't Anfield. It's West Ham. They've blown it against West Ham. I think they've bottled it. But I tell you what, Arteta cannot be the person that bottles missing a penalty or or letting a goal in on his front post uh, or blowing a 2-0 lead. Let's get into it, lads. Start off with you, Watto. Uh, Arsenal thoughts? Um... I'm very much like yourself. The game at Liverpool, 2-0, it's a tough place to go. You accept it's a good point. It actually moves you a step closer in the right direction. 2-0 up at West Ham after an incredible start. You cannot you cannot lose that game. I feel sorry for Saka in terms of missing the penalty and all that comes with it. Mm. But the game is still 90 minutes around that. And 2-0 up, well, yeah, you can see the goal, it's 2-1. But you've still got to have a better mentality to see that game out. At West Ham... I don't think they're a great team at home. Played um, Thursday night as well, are vulnerable. Yeah, you've got to take. They've travelled. You've got to take advantage of that situation. That game fell in Arsenal's lap, and they didn't take advantage. And for all the plaudits we give Ramsdale um, the week before, he will be so disappointed with that goal. I think it's a little bit of a freakish one because I think Bowen gets a really good contact on a really difficult he ball. Took it really well, didn't really he? well to get a contact, but. I think Ramsdale's not expecting that kind of contact and because he hits it into the floor, he's just not aware. You know, it's that always expect the unexpected and he's thinking there's no way he's getting that kind of contact and that's the moment of the league. Good quality players and he actually gets a good contact and he, he gets beat at the near post and for somebody of his ability, but the levels that he's now set himself from the previous week, but what he's done all season, that again is another two points that they'll look back on and it could be a big moment come the end of the season. It feels like it. It does feel like it. Will, do you think that's just the, the thing that people have been saying about Arsenal for quite a while now is that they've not been in a title race? Man City have this capability to win every single game, which is subhuman. Do you think that that has to go down, even though Arsenal fans don't want it to be as effectively, like Watto says, they have effectively bottled that game that they shouldn't be bottling it, and it's nerves, maybe. Yeah, I think the worst thing is, and we'll come on to City, is it's the backdrop of City are like absolutely purring at the moment, aren't they? They're just putting the hammer down. It's like 27 goals in the last six games. They're just going for it, really putting the pressure on. And I think what Arsenal's next three games have got after the Southampton, like City, uh, Chelsea and Manchester United as well. So I think those three games, I mean, that's going to decide the league title, isn't it? And I think it all comes in... I'm not putting the focus on Rob Holden because I think he's been doing okay. But with Saliba out, and you'll know more on this, what I, just the whole defensive structure of the team and just the confidence that you have knowing that partnership's there in front of your goalkeeper, it's all set. And, and that's gone really in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I, I agree. You, you talk about the fixtures that are now coming. That's why the, the, the 2-0 loss, it feels like a loss yeah. because the fixtures that are coming up on paper are certainly a lot more difficult. And if you can't get a couple of these players back who you're missing, and certainly the, the unit of the back four and him playing centre-half have been really solid. And I, like Holding's doing the best he can, yeah. but the levels between the two of them are huge. And your team still needs that solidarity in that area to get you over the line. If you're 2-0 two, two up at Liverpool and you're 2-0 up at West Ham and you take two points, it's not good enough when you're trying to win that league. Well, no, it's like... Um... I think even Bournemouth, if they were 2-0 up against West Ham away, would expect to win that game. And there's, there's absolutely no... I think what Arsenal have got to do, in my opinion, is they've just got to take it on the chin. And, and that Etihad game becomes absolutely huge because I don't think anyone sat here saying, Arsenal have bottled it, you're bottlers. I mean, that's ridiculous. I want Arsenal to win the league as a United fan. I don't want City to win it. But I think 
it will do Arsenal well to realise what happened. And also, I think the backdrop of all of this is that Arsenal have been incredible. We've spoken week after week after week about how good they are, how consistent they are. Um, but, like, I've, I woke up this morning and some people having to go at Arteta for his subs and stuff like that. I mean, I saw Saka miss a sitter in the second half. I saw him miss a penalty. Um, and actually, in the last 10 minutes, West Ham seemed to have the momentum. Yeah. So how, how, how do you think they, they, they roll on from this? Um, just a quick, brief look at that Man City game a week on Wednesday because I think they'll beat Southampton and then that, that's the game. C- c- what do they do for that? I think that their preparation now, um, only obviously looking from afar like we are, I think um, they would have been in, they'd had a debrief, surely. I would have been really positive post Liverpool because I think it would have stepped in the right direction. Now it's more difficult as a manager or a coach because you, you've had big moments in the game and you're playing a West Ham team who are, who are trying to stay in the league and you have to go and win that game. Mm. Um, and I think in the moments where I think they've had real good mentality, they seem to have dropped off that mentality in the last two games. But if I'm a manager, you have to go on. I wouldn't be speaking anything negativity. You've got to be on the front foot in terms of the home game against Southampton to get that momentum and get on a roll again, to take something into that game at Man City, which is obviously a brutal game. But everybody actually, I think, if I'm Arsenal, and you get through the, uh, the Southampton game with a win... Everybody's expecting City to beat you. So I would use that as a siege mentality approach. And I think, you know, if you can come out of Manchester not getting beaten, you're still going to be in front. Mm. And I think that can change the season for them as well. So they've got to come through Southampton with a win and hopefully get some momentum. But then I would think, for me, if I were coaching or managing that team, everybody expects us to get beat. But we're here, we're in this room, we're the team, we're in it together. We've worked for 40 weeks of the season, we've got four games left, come on. And, and I think that could actually bring them together. I think it's going to be difficult because how do you set up for that game? Because if you try and take the point, City are at a point now where at the start of the season they weren't really pulling teams apart, but now they are, so you're going to get picked apart. It's weird because City are almost fake. I don't know how I line Actually, I do know how I line up, so I've played 4-2-3-1 on Football Manager for 10 years, gay confess, so I'll just do that, I think. I think they've got to go and try and win. I think if you go and draw at Man City, it's a problem. But that's for the future. That's for the future. Uh, You can't have any regrets. Um, Talking about regrets, Newcastle might have some regrets. We're going to go to you on this one as a Blues fan. But uh, Aston Villa beat Newcastle 3-0 on the Saturday lunchtime. It's sort of been forgotten and it shouldn't be because they're definitely champ of the week, Aston Villa. No doubt about that. Um, He's took them from 16th to 6th given the heaviest defeat of the season to Newcastle. I think they've scored in every game under Emery. I think it's six wins in the last seven. People are talking about top four. As a Blues fan, you must be over the moon. But more importantly, <laughs> you've, you can't not big up Villa. We've, we've got you this section on purpose. What are your thoughts on that at the weekend? Well, I was saying last time we did it, some bloke did an article about how praising I was uh, in the Birmingham Mail about Villa. So I'll be short, Shrift. Yeah, they're doing good. Uh, Watkins, <laughs> good. <laughs> Ramsey, good. I don't want to say too much, but it really does look good. Let's flip it the other way, because you're struggling. Yeah. Um, Newcastle, <laughs> Newcastle, though, I mean, they, they comprehensively beat United a couple yeah. of weeks ago. They had a game after that, I forget where they went. I think it was Brentford, uh, and won really, really well. Not easy to do that. That is, uh, for me, that's a sign of how good Villa are, but Newcastle, will have, they look shell-shocked, and, and they, were, they were comprehensively beaten. It was a real statement, and, and Newcastle now... We're going to talk about Spurs in a minute, but that's a bit of a that drags them back into a top four race now. I think that was the first time I've really seen this season where Eddie Howe does so well to get everything out of those players that, like you, you see the squad and like the likes of Jacob Murphy where he's got more out of, but he missed a really good chance. Almiron missed a really good chance where he should have maybe squared it. Dan Byrne was a little bit lacklustre in that challenge on on Watkins, so he's done so well with these players, but it's in this back end of the season where that squad really might sort of just be a little bit lacking, especially if you're challenging for Champions League football. And I, 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 still, I still think they will get it, but it's going to be very tough and he's going to almost have to get another level out of these players that, in reality, are probably sort of mid-table players, really. Yeah, yeah, he's struggling, what I mean, really. He's struggling. Get, get, get me on. Get you on for Villa, though. I mean, look, I think at the moment, United have definitely got Villa in a couple of games' time and and, you know... I worry about it because I think if I actually think Villa would give City a game at the moment. They're probably the two informed teams of, of, of the Premier League at the moment. Their their stats don't lie. They're, they're so good. They're, and, and it comes down to coaching. We'll talk about Chelsea and how crappy is in a minute. But oh yeah, I've been really impressed with Villa. 
Really impressed. I've been and watched them a couple of games at Villa Park uh, this season and, and they've looked the real deal. I think you can see that Emery's got a way and a style about him. The players have obviously bought into it. He's tactically very, very aware and it looked like a, a road a step too far for Newcastle. Um, Watkins at the post, I think after 30 seconds, they were just on the front foot from the start. That's how they've always started the games at Villa Park when I've been. And obviously you'd expect Newcastle to be aware, be ready for it. I think Pope made four or five saves, you know, big blocks. Villa could have run out, you know, a cricket score. And I think they did make a difference there. I'm not sure whether Newcastle can sustain this to keep in the top four. Early in the season, I thought they were playing incredible football. They'd got the momentum. I think I think the fans at home can maybe see them over the line. But it's it's that stage of the season where legs are getting a bit tired. Mentally, they've not been there before. If Newcastle can get back into the Champions League, like when Bobby Robson were there, the whole thing lifts up a level again. They're going to hope for massive recruitment again in the summer. They've got the finance to do it. But... He has done so well with that group of players and it's whether they've just actually got to that ceiling and somehow, again, he's got to get that momentum for this last half a dozen games. I've got a question for you. Who would you rather have as manager, Eddie Howe, Wuna or Emre? Oh. You know what? I, I'll jump in and I was just, what I was going to say in follow, following what Watto said is that I think in relation to Unai Emery, um, I was always a big defender of Potter that he hadn't had a pre-season um, and he'd inherited the transfer window, but... Emery's not had a pre-season and he's not had a transfer window. And that team, from what Gerard was doing to being one of the best in the Premier League, um, I think Eddie Howe's more fashionable, but technically I'd probably go for Emery. I think um, my answer on that will be twofold. I really like what Emery's done. I think he was really underrated at Arsenal. Timing were wrong for him. He's come to Villa. Yeah, they've got money, they've got investment, but he's not had any time with them, really. Mm-hmm. But tactically, he knows how to prepare his team. He knows what they want. You can see that when the the playing on the training field, he's done he's done his business. I'm always an advocate for the English or British manager. I really wanted Graham Potter to do well. I thought he'd done incredible stuff at Brighton, and I think Eddie Howe did incredible stuff at Bournemouth. He's taken it up to a bigger club and actually done well. I want them to get over the line, but I think we as English and British managers, coaches, we have to still have a look at what what the overseas guys are bringing. And if we can just get a little bit of that, then I think we can really push it forward. So it's a sitting on the fence. Answer. You're going to go anyhow? Oh, yeah, anyhow all day, yeah. Mm. Like, absolutely every time. I think one thing to give Unai some credit was, I think like, Villa brought in Luca Dean back last year and that was supposed to be you know big fanfare around that signing. We know he's injury prone. It was sort of a, all the money they're chucking over. But Alex Moreno had a great game at the weekend. He sort of replaced him as first team left back. And it's sort of that smart recruiting that he's probably got so much more experience of where Gerard had, had those transfer windows, brought in the likes of Coutinho, who, I mean, he's not even featuring now, is he really? So I think, yeah, it's just smart all around from training to recruitment to everything. And that is the nicest thing I will say on Villa today. It's the underpinning of coaching, isn't it? I think we've seen it this season. We'll get on to Chelsea in a minute. But the Thomas Franks of this world, the Silvers, the Deserbys, the Emerys, they're winning through. Eddie Howe, you know, it's coaching. Ten Hag, Arteta, Pep, coaching. That's what's winning through this season. OK, so uh, sticking with the top four, we're going to look at Tottenham against Bournemouth. Another bottle job. From Tottenham, um, North London, they're at it, aren't they? But uh, Tottenham uh, losing 3-2 to Bournemouth. I mean, look, the first place to start, and we're always going to be fair on the football fill-in, we'll stick with coaching, Gary O'Neill. Uh, we'll go we'll start Watto with this one. Um, what a job he's doing to keep yep. them up. Brilliant. What a, what a job. Very nice. What a job. Yeah, Very good. Nice. Very good. That's a new feature. Um, the obviously... viewers don't need telling the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> some do, some do. <laughs> some definitely do. But no, start of the season, obviously, Bournemouth made a change with Parker. Um, obviously, he weren't quite happy with the recruitment. Gary O'Neill comes in and had a really good run with them. But now, they look a proper team again. Yeah. I would have said, I think the last time I came on the, the fill in, I, I thought there were shoe ins for going down. Shoe-ins. But they've performed really, really well. They were unlucky to get beat at Arsenal a few weeks ago. And that kind of galvanised them into some momentum. Yeah, they've had a couple of blips along the way, but they actually look like they're a proper team now and they're playing for each other and they're so close now. A couple of results and, and they're over the you know they're over the, the points mark. Um, I think he's done a really good job. I don't know him personally, but I think, again, because they changed so early with Parker, I think in that wobbly time when probably if he'd have been from the start, he'd have probably gone. But because he's the second manager in... They've had to, they've had to like back him because they've already made one change, and I think that's proved to be the right decision. 
But that's sometimes the naivety of the owners. If you have Gary O'Neill from the start, when the wobble came, he was probably gone. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, the stats don't back up well when you're changing two or three managers a season. So I think going through that wobble and sticking with him, the players are obviously know what he and his staff are all about and they're, they're doing it properly because obviously Tottenham equalised two or three minutes from the end. Normally at that point, you know, normally in the games, five, six minutes injury time, you're thinking Bournemouth concede so yeah. many goals, yeah. they're going to get beat 3-2. But actually they flipped it on its head and still didn't settle for that 2-2. They wanted that win. They felt Spurs were vulnerable and actually... You know, the, the goals that actually scored were good goals. Good it's goal. interesting, actually, because I spoke to a Bournemouth fan on Saturday night um, on, on a radio show and they were saying that they, they apologised to Gary O'Neill and they and they applauded the ownership, which is such a rarity this season because they said, you know what, we wanted Gary O'Neill to go, the ownership stuck with him and they've gone been proven right. And I thought, what a refreshing fan view, but also what a refreshing thing this season because I think the ownerships have got so many, so many different clubs have got it wrong and and then you go to Spurs um, Will and um, Spurs fans were calling in on Saturday night saying we just don't feel attached to our football club, all they're interested in is Beyonce and the NFL and this go-kart track and you know Davinson Sanchez is being booed off the pitch, it's just, an, you know, Harry Kane's probably going to want to leave um, they let Conte go, they've stuck with Conte's assistance, there's no manager bounce and when we spoke about Newcastle, I, I think Spurs are really going to struggle to get top four Yeah and then I think you look on beyond that as well and you mentioned like Kane going and they, we've said it before, they're just in such a tricky position where everyone else above them is spending more and it's going to get even crazy like if Manchester United get bought so then you're stuck in this situation where you've got this new stadium you need to put on you know better players and a bit more around that and they're they're not in that position to really purchase those world-class players are they so I yeah, I worry for them they're definitely not going to get top four the manager's not really changed anything at all and so it was just indicative of they scored that equaliser going into injury time and then they concede at home to Bournemouth I mean it just absolutely stinks doesn't it it does and I think you know I think this morning they're talking about Chelsea are going to get um, I can't never pronounce his name right um, Nagelsmann or how you pronounce it take that, yeah. and um, no they do it in a different way there's something there's it, anyway whatever um, ex Bayern Munich um, <coughs> apparently going to go to Chelsea so that leaves I mean the Spurs being linked with people like Brendan Rodgers it's, it's shocking but what, where, did, where do you well, get both of your points on this because it was a big topic at the weekend I didn't say I felt sorry for Davinson Sanchez, by the way. I've been misquoted because I've, of, I've often um, slated Manchester United players because I personally believe every fan's got the right to do that. If you think somebody's not good enough for your shirt, you've got the right to do it. I don't believe we're booing in the stadium. I think that's a bit too far, but I can't be a hypocrite. I have slated enough United players over the years who I don't think are good enough. But Davinson Sanchez, I think he came on and then got subbed off, um, booed as well. What, 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 what's that I mean you're an ex-player yourself so yeah. you've got that sort of thing it's, ha, ha, what's your thoughts on that I think when that happens to you as a player it's it's as brutal as it gets yeah. it really is but it's also the subliminal message to the rest of the group Yeah. and I don't know whether the, I obviously don't know the manager he obviously he's been Conte's assistant he can only work in Conte's style so the tactics and all the things that they're doing it's just a, a replica of Conte being there. Obviously, he's a different character and personality and he may be give the players a cuddle or whatever. We don't know that behind the scenes. But the tactics and the, the way the team plays is the same. Um, I don't know whether he's felt a little bit under underpowered with the situation. And obviously, when you sub somebody in and sub somebody off, you're saying, I'm, I'm, I'm manager. But for the player, it's bad. And I think the message to the other players is not always great. It's bad on the manager, though, isn't it? Because they've made a glaring error. You know, they've, they've taken yeah. a player off. They've yeah. brought him on and they've took him off. I mean, all right, you've owned your error, but you've also made the error. Yeah. Well, it's just errors all over, isn't it? Like, I think the favourite for the job this morning is Vincent Company, which mm-hmm. on paper sounds great, but yeah. he, I think even he'd turn it down just because he knows, like, it's such a mess at that club and he needs more experience. And I think Brendan Rodgers is his second favourite. You need someone like that. They've got to realise their position. They're in the same position as sort of like the, the Brightons of this world where they need to get better recruitment, do better, and then try and crack on. But the other recruitment can't can't recruit for two years so that's the problem they're getting you know what I mean he's banned he he can't do anything but the whole thing stinks like obviously Daniel Livy's been there so long but they've got a wonderful stadium but the team to me looks like it's crumbling so if I'm a fan I like turning up all this but you're paying to go and see your 11 players on the field and at the minute I don't see them getting in the top four and if anything they're getting further away from that because as you rightly said, the bigger boys are going to spend again. Yeah. Mm. And they can't compete with that. 
But they're also not ever, and I'm not being disrespectful to Brendan Rodgers being linked with the job or whoever else, they're never going to get the big, big managers there. But look, when they, when they got Conte no... as well, it's like that's all gone wrong because he expects up here and they can't deliver that yeah. up there. But I think that in Pochettino, they had yeah. one of the greatest modern managers. One of the, yes, they didn't win anything, but one of the greatest. Every player that I spoke to when I first joined Southampton, I did the national team and then I worked with the, some of the guys at Spurs. I've never heard anybody say a bad word about that guy. He would speak to the lady in the canteen, the under-13 coach in the academy. He brought everything together. But that fell apart as well. And that fell apart. So I I don't really know what they expect or what they want from their manager when I think they've had one of the best. Well, one Spurs fan was saying over the weekend that uh, they should have brought Harry Redknapp in. And after I'd stopped laughing, after I'd stopped laughing, I actually thought, but at the end of the day, if you look at what Palace have done with Hodgson, they did need some change Mm. because what they've got is a joke. Um, I suppose the only positive for, um, for well, Southampton got a bit of a positive, didn't they? Because with the winning goal for Bournemouth, Hoiberg got sent back to Southampton, so he might keep him up. <laughs> might keep him up there. But yeah, Spurs need to get an identity back. They definitely do. Um, let's see what happens with them. I don't fancy them for top four. Who I do fancy for top four is my club, Manchester United. Absolutely fantastic result at Nottingham Forest in the Sunday game. Um, keeper was man of the match. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, Will. Caught the highlights. Caught the highlights of it. Dominant performance from Manchester United. Yeah, well, there was a lot of talk. I know you had a lot of injuries, but I mean, the way some Manchester United fans going into the game talking about the. I mean, this is Manchester United, as Gary Neville would We're say. Manchester United. We're Manchester United. So I think the squad has got to play its role if you're going to get top four, and it did. Nice to see Anthony scoring there. He kicked on. Yeah. A big, you were a big fan of him as well. And even the assist was absolutely sublime to play that little ball into Delo. I know we're going to chat about the penalty. I thought it was a penalty. Well, let's do it now. Let's do it now because I think that. Um, there's sort of we've, we've still got two more to come, but there's been some dodgy refereeing decisions this weekend. Unfortunately, it's almost, almost a regular section. Uh, I, I would say three that we need to sort of assess in, uh, within this Man United game. Obviously, the Harry Maguire one, the corner travels a long way. He goes to head it blindly. His hand is out. It hits him there. Um, defended blindly, really, for, for, for the first ten <laughs> minutes. But he did stabilise after that. Um, there was a Pulisic one against Brighton where the ball goes through and his arms out and it hits him there. And then, obviously, there's a penalty that was given against Antonio. So... All three penalties, uh, Go. you start with it, Will. Do you think all three are penalties? Do you think they got it right? You said the Maguire one was a penalty, which is obviously wrong. Yeah, I'd, I think all three pens. Yeah. I've not seen the Pulisic one, but I like pens. I just think, what, though, that consistency is what we want. And yeah, if everybody on the pitch knows that... I would rather know if it hits your hand between there and there, accidental or not, it's a penalty. Because yeah. at least you can live with that and go, oh, it was so unlucky. But We have to take the, the, the whole uh, idea of VAR for me was to take mistakes, take grey areas out of this thing. It's black and white and we're going to get some consistency. So players, managers, coaches, fans, we all know the outcome on certain instances. Yeah. And I think the inconsistency, my personal view is, certainly when you're a defender like that and Maguire on a set piece little bit of barge, you know. But if it hits your hand there in the six-yard box, it's got to be a penalty. I, I can't see any other outcome. I, I don't understand it. It's um, unlucky, but... It's un- yeah, it's yeah. unlucky. But w- when you get the physicality of what football is and you're just getting a little bit of barge in and that... You, you, you potential for it, but with the rules as they are, that cannot be any other than a penalty. Mm-hmm. And uh, Steve Cooper's right, yeah, we'll get an apology tomorrow morning. He's obviously hyping it up. But it's of no consequence. They're in the bottom three... They could have, with some momentum, started the game better. Look, Man United were head and shoulders above, but I think it's a penalty. And I, and I think, I'm like yourself, I think all three have to be penalties. I, I just think you've just got to stick with it. So everybody's on the same page. And we shouldn't be having these conversations. Normally, the pub talk after a game what could be the controversial decision from a referee. Yeah. But we shouldn't have that now. No. We shouldn't have that now. It should be very, very clear. And I, I don't know what Howard Webb can do, because he can't keep apologising. We can't keep saying you're not good enough, you're not good enough. Somebody gets a rest this weekend from VAR because they sat in Stockley Park having a coffee and not watching what they should be watching. You know what I mean? They've got to be clear and concise on these decisions. Otherwise, the VAR is just not working. Also, the good times aren't rolling as well because if you look at the officiating in the EFL, I mean, us three could do a better job down the Sunday League Park because it's absolutely honking. So there's no, there's no one well, coming not, in better. It's not going to be. There's no pathway. It's, no. It's, yeah. That's the problem. They're all but, crap. 
well, I saw that clip in the Wrexham game. Um, ben wanted a shout out for Wrexham, um, and um, yeah, that wasn't a red card either. But at the very, we've got the best league, and we were talking just before we started that if Arsenal don't win the league by two points, we all know a referee forgot to do a line. I mean, if Brighton don't get top four by three points, we all know a, a referee forgot to give him a penalty against Spurs, which would have won in the game. And I think Watto's right. Give them all as penalties because then as we as the consumer, yeah. at least, look, if that is a penalty against Harry Maguire, I'm going to say, oh, he can't see it. You know, it's bang unlucky, but it has it his arm. I know, rules, it, I know it's a handball. Yeah. yeah, I know it's and handball. And I think that's where the players are problem as well. The rules state that that's handball, mm. but you get two given, one not given. Where, where are you at with it? Well, Maguire well, would be spewing, spewing if that's given against him. Yeah. But actually, there's three United players against one Forest player. Nobody's took charge of the situation, and he hit your arm in the six-yard box. It's a penalty. Well, it's like last week we talked about the Matoma penalty, but I've just remembered he controlled the ball there, yeah. and that's a handball. But Harry Maguire, <laughs> there, that's oh, not a handball. It's, it's then the, you've said it before, the worst thing, they'll get trotted out on Monday morning on Sky Sports, and it's like the BTEC Mafia, isn't it? They'll all like club in together and say, like, oh, whatever he said, that's the right decision, and we get nowhere. And I, do, I can do yes. Dermot Gallagher. At the end of the day, it's not him on the arm. It's, a, it's an illusion. It's not hit his arm. His arm is broken in half. The ball's gone through it and then it's connected again. It's not a handball. But look, I think that, that linesman didn't get a ban last week either. You know, I'm sorry, uh, consistently on this show and, and everywhere else, no one's got any faith in the Referees Association and that's a bad look. You look like a dictatorship. You look like people who are actually just interested in self-preservation rather than we've got a great league that you are ruining. I think that's simple. But back to Manchester United. You mentioned Anthony. I'm a big fan of his Watto. I thought yesterday, fantastic, got a goal. But for the first time, really, we saw him pick the ball up on the right-hand side, travel, go past the player and slip a player in. And that's what you want from a wing. Uh, that's what I thought. I thought he looked like you were playing with a smile on his face again. Um, Until Maguire came up to him. Have you yeah. seen that clip? I don't know. I can't <laughs> think this. But he sees the low, he's looked like he's got a PlayStation for Christmas. And then he sees Maguire and looks like he's got a pair of socks. He goes from smile to... I don't know. I think it may be Camry trick. But, I don't know. <laughs> but no, he did. He did play with a smile on his face, and and actually the ability that he's got. That's how he should be playing. And when you play for Man United as a winger, you're expected to go and attack people, mm. and be on the front foot. And he got a great assist for Dallo for sure. But the nice thing, if you're a coach, is seeing Martial get slipped in, yeah. winning the ball high up, but your wingers coming in for that rebound and the opportunity. He's driving in. It's the full intent. He's playing proper football. He's sniffing that opportunity and, uh, yeah, it's a great finish for him. I thought, yeah, as a United fan, I thought that the loss of Varane and Martinez is a big blow, but what was so good yesterday was Casemiro, Eriksen, Bruno, Sancho, Martial, Anthony. They were just intent. They were moving the ball quick. And I know it's Forest, but it was a dominant performance. That puts them 59 points, six points clear of Spurs with the game in hand. I think if you get 70 points, you've got top four this year. Eight games to go. I think we've got Wolves, West Ham, Fulham, and somebody else not that good as well. I, I think, I'm not going to say it will, but you can if you want. United looking very good for top four now. Yeah, I think just because everyone behind sort of spluttering as well, I think yeah. that the top four is going to be. And I think it, uh, down to Ten Hag as well, like that, that performance at the weekend, there's so many players that have been out of the cold and come back in, like Sancho, Anthony, a little bit, Martial, but they still feel part of the squad and can still put on that performance. So it's a lot of credit to him. I think the world got top four, so you'll be very happy. Mm. And Champions League football coming back to Old Trafford. I can actually start watching Emmerdale on a Thursday now. <laughs> Perfect. But the one thing I would say on that is, like, obviously you get the injury in the warm-up. It shows you if you've got the quality on the bench yeah. to bring in an Ericsson who wouldn't have been sulking. He's not starting. He's a proper professional. He's played at the level. Injury before the game. He can come in. Nothing really out of place. And, and nothing's affected, go and play your football and win. And that's sometimes the benefit of having the, the good squad and, yeah. the, and, the, and the experienced players. It's a great point, that, actually, because Savitza got injured in the warm-up and I don't think Ericsson could have done any better. He was superb. Um, anyway, let's move on to our next one. OK, from top-level coaching to Poundland coaching, I would describe, uh, this is <laughs> Chelsea against Brighton. Now, I had the, I had the fortune of watching this game because I absolutely... Wa the, the, Brighton are the new Leeds. I used to like watching Leeds under Bielsa, even though they'd probably lose. It was entertaining. But Brighton are entertaining and win. Dominant at Stamford Bridge. Um, absolutely fantastic goal from Enciso, I think he's called. But um, Chelsea went 1-0 up with a deflected goal. And for most of the game, they had 30% possession. They hardly had any shots on goal. Frank Lampard said after the game, they've got to do the basics better. You look at what Hodgson's done, 
in a very short period of time. Uh, first of all, what 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 is your thoughts? We'll go to you, Will, first. On Chelsea, the appointment of Lampard, I've always thought Stamford Bridge was a difficult place to go. Yeah. If I was a Chelsea fan, they've been calling up for Potter to go long enough. Mm. How can they... How can they the feel-good factor under Frank, it <laughs> seems to be the, the, the mask over their face. They're not seeing it. Well, never go back to an X. That's the golden rule, isn't it? And they yeah. have done, and it's not worked, and they got absolutely smacked this weekend. I think like Brighton had what fifty-eight percent possession at Stamford Bridge. You mentioned Frank coming out in the post-match comments. I think the other one who's like, "This isn't the Chelsea way." Well, it's not two thousand and eight, Frank. We're not going to get the Champions League. We're not going to get the Premier Leagues anymore. So let's gloss over that. And um, we're speaking about Brentford and Brighton. Just the recruitment of like, I mean, we're big fans of Evan Ferguson, aren't we? I think mm. he's going to miss the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so that's yeah, a big yeah. shame. But they were just completely dom- dominant and just make. We spoke about coaching so much, even on today's show. But that just comes to the fore, and you can't rely on just sort of like we've said, having a hundred Premier League caps and goals. And it's just not a good coach. And the, the fact that they had the chance to win the Champions League and they've just thrown it away by getting someone like Frank Lampard. And I think it's if you're a Chelsea fan, you're like, I don't know what Ted Bowley's doing beforehand, and now I definitely know, don't know what he's doing. Yeah, it's a great point, Watto, isn't it? Because again, we spoke about the Bournemouth factor. Chelsea, that feels to me like the ownership at Chelsea. I think his heart's in the right place, but it feels like he's like he's on... He, I think he actually is on Twitter. Yeah. And I think he manages the club off Twitter. He's looking at fan opinion and it's like he's saving his own ass all the time. Sacks Tuchel, goes down to Potter, goes down to Lampard. You, you will get this. I was saying this is a little bit like going from divorcing Margot Robbie to marrying Sharon off EastEnders to divorcing her and managing <laughs> Theresa May. It's, just, it's getting gradually worse and worse and worse. But you've got to look at the ownership, haven't you? Yeah, look, the Chelsea fans are obviously not happy, but I, I, you cannot have the crazy naivety of chopping and changing managers. Frank Lampard is a great guy, great footballer, but... Is he a Premier League man, a proven Premier League manager at the moment? No, he's not. He's had a chance at Chelsea. They would have surely been better staying with Graham Potter. Mm. They take time to gel a football team. He spent so much money. They're, they're a group of individuals, and that takes time to gel. Potter's proved over a period of time at Brighton, which is a different level compared to what we're talking with Chelsea. But good recruitment, good training get the team together, he produced a proper team. Chelsea have given him the tools by spending millions upon millions, but they've not given him time to gel the tools together. Um, They've make a change, Frank comes in, still lost three games, they've actually scored a goal, so Chelsea fans will be like, come on, we've finally got a goal after 24 hours or whatever it is. Um, But it's not good enough. It's simply not good enough. And Brighton absolutely destroyed them, wiped them off the table. The only positive for Chelsea is finally they're getting some money's worth out of the goalie because he actually made four or five top yeah, saves in yeah, the game. Did, yeah. Otherwise, it would have been a cricket score. But they got absolutely obliterated. The guys come into Brighton and he just carried on uh, Potter's work. He'll have tweaked it with his own uh, few ideas. But they're a proper team. If you looked at the two teams on paper, it's chalk and cheese. You expect Brighton to get top four. Chelsea are going to finish mid-table. It is interesting because we mentioned the Bournemouth thing and the fan who said, look, I'm sorry about O'Neill and well done to the club for sticking by it. We'll have Chelsea fans watching this who'll be going absolutely mad. We shouldn't have kept Potter. We shouldn't have kept Potter. I I agree with you. I think they should have done because ultimately the owners should, good owners should not listen to the fans all of the time. This happened with Van Van Hal at um, Man United. We wanted him out at Christmas and they stuck with him till May because they wanted Mourinho in the summer and and that worked. Like just they what the week before Potter's here for the long term next week. You know, and, and the thing under Potter is they were dominating teams. They just couldn't put the ball in the back of the net. Yeah. Now under Lampard, they're getting dominated. Like it's, it's and still can't put it in the net. Yeah, yeah. It's just completely flipped around. But on Brighton, um, what? They, 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 I mean, we won't spend ages on it. But fantastic side. They're doing so well. Um, Evan Ferguson gets subbed off. Um, Veltman gets sent off, and then the two lads who come on, I think Nciso did come on for, for Veltman, uh, well, Beck and him score the goals, and, and the system doesn't change. And, and, and Pep himself said this weekend that um, De Zerbi's Brighton are the best progressive team out from the back. They're a joy to watch. Well, it was literally from the first minute as well, wasn't it? I think in the first 10 minutes, they were closing them down in, in Chelsea's box and just winning the ball. I mean, 
Danny Welbeck's like Benjamin Button and he just gets better with age. He keeps on going and, and the strike, I think he hit the post as well, the, the 19 year old, didn't he? And then yeah, he yeah. goes and scores one like that. So they've just got everything right. If you're going through it, if you're doing a report card, they've got recruitment right, the coaching's right, just everything's flowing for them and, and they're getting the results on the pitch. And with under Potter, like we said, everyone just talked about XG under Potter, wasn't it? They're not converting. Well, they definitely are now. And they, with the games left, they could have a run on that top four. It's not over yet, is it? No, and I can't, Man United play them in the FA Cup semi-final next week. Can't wait to see what happens in that one. Um, let's 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 go to uh, Manchester City against Leicester City. Um, look, Man City looking like the dominant force in the title race now. They've done it all before. They, they, they're capable of winning 50 games in a row. We know that. They've got all the money. They've got the best manager. They've got the best squad. It's very boring for me, but that's because I support Manchester United. Um, Erling Haaland has, I think, equaled the record that Mo Salah set now. I think the record is bigger than that for Shearer and Cole, but they played more games, I think. But uh, he's going to break that record, isn't he, Erling Haaland and Watto? And yeah. a very straightforward... I mean, look, I say boring, but did you, did you expect anything else? I expected nothing less. The stats over the years, they always score three goals at home, predominantly against most teams, even the big teams. Uh, so actually the surprise were after getting 3 nil up after 20 odd minutes that, that they didn't go on but obviously they've got Champions League again it, get, it must be great for a manager the game's done after 20 minutes you can make your changes as the game goes along they just dominate the ball as they always do um, I think because they dominated the ball so much it allowed Leicester to get on the front foot in the second half they obviously got one uh, from a corner Inacho hit the post some good chances in that last 10 or 15 minutes. But let's be honest, if Man City had needed to go and score three more goals, they could have gone and scored three more goals. But it gave Leicester a little bit of a glimmer of hope. Again, they've brought a new new manager in. Real tough start. Nobody's expecting anything at Man City. But I, I, I fear for Leicester, for sure. Um, I think replacing Brendan so late in and having actually gone... A couple of games extra with Adam Sadler, who I know as a young home, coach. Home games as well that were really important. Six pivotal, pivotal games where actually whoever they decided were going to be manager, they it, when you change Brennan, they had to make a change yeah. and, and really go for them a couple of games. Uh, we'll come to Palace the same. You know, they, they've changed, but the change that appeared where they could get a bounce and like Leicester missed the boat on the two games. Then they've gone, obviously brought Dean in. Uh, and give him the toughest challenge of all to go to Man City and try and get something. Pointless, isn't it? Po- po- pointless Literally. change. <laughs> pointless at that point. Um, but it's going to be really difficult for him and that team to get over the line. I, I think they've got a difficult run in and he's got seven games yeah. and they're going to have to probably win four of them. Yeah, interesting. Well, you've covered the Leicester angle off. Let's go to, to the Man City angle. I've seen a treble. Uh, um, I'm old enough to remember that. Um I'm a little bit concerned uh, about it. I think Man City have got the momentum and they're probably favourites for every one of them at the moment. I think they're favourites for the FA Cup, the favourites for the league and they're favourites for the Champions League. Uh, where, where do you sit on that, Will? Because they've, they seem to... Uh, these FA charges annoy me because we need to know the answer. It's 100 FA charges and I feel like Man City, to me, are a little bit like Marvel. They don't, they're not real. It's, it feels a bit fake. But it's a good watch. Um, we're never going to find this out. We're not going to find out this season. They could win a treble. That's not their fault. But I feel it's galvanised them. I feel that Pep reacted to those charges with insult. And you can feel it in the team. I think it's perfect alignment with when they hit those charges. They've basically become this juggernaut again. Um, what, what do you think the limit is for this Man City side? Do you think they're storming to a treble? It's a bit like the uh, last dance, isn't it, Michael Jordan? You can see Pep there sat with the iPad thinking, yeah, and that really bothered me. And then that was the switch. And yeah. they've just gone on and done it, haven't they? So I think... And there was a little bit of talk, not from me, but of like people saying, oh, it's Haaland, you know, just had a great... Well, he's just absolutely smashed out of the water, hasn't he? So I think the big statement performance was that Bayern Munich display, yeah. wasn't it? In the Champions League, at home. Not just a 1-2-1, one, it was a 3-0. And if they can just keep going the way they're going. And even the likes of Jack Grealish, a lot of people wrote him off last season, yeah. but we know with under Pep, it takes a while to, mm. to learn that system. John Stone's in this hybrid role, scoring a volley. I mean, he just makes... Pep- hey, left foot volley, come on. Left lad from foot, Barnsley, yeah, yeah. lad from Barnsley. <laughs> you, you just don't get it, do you? Well, actually, that's a good point. We were going to go goal of the week. Who would you go for? And see so Chelsea or Stones against Leicester? I've got a good Stones. Barnsley lad, left foot volley outside the box. Come and on. Centre back, yeah. Centre back, come on, yeah. yeah, come on. I'll go and see so, just 19 year old, and it's the winner away at home. Yeah, I'm definitely going to go and see so because I don't like City. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
but I it was a good. If it wasn't anybody <laughs> other than a City player, I would have okay, gone for it. Okay. Just back on Leicester though, Dean Smith, what I just don't get at all because there's there's no proof in the pudding that like he went in at Norwich at the end of the yeah. season, they got relegated, and then you think it right set for the Championship, but he got sacked in Norwich in the Championship as well. And when he was at Villa, it was great, but there was sort of that perfect storm. It was the perfect romance, and obviously he did it at Brentford, but we're talking what nearly six, seven years ago I think now. it's weird though, isn't it? Because like, I agree with Brendan Rodgers getting the sack, but I think it should have happened a long time ago. And I think there's not really any, there's no Sam Allardyce around, is there, to go and keep somebody up at the moment? I think West, Ham are, right, West Ham are right to keep David Moyes because yeah. he's, he's done it before, even though probably does deserve the sack. But the Leicester one was just weird. And as you said, Dean Smith, I mean, let's have a quick bounce into that, actually. Give me a three who's going down, Will. Well, I came on, I think I said Forest, Bournemouth and Southampton last time, but Bournemouth have shown up. Yeah. So I think, I think I'm going to add Leicester into the... I'm going to do Southampton, Leicester. I still go Forest as well. Yeah, what time? I would uh, concur. But like the last time I did the same, I was always for Bournemouth. Yeah. Mm. But it's just really nice to see, you mentioned it, the ownership, the fans, and they've stuck with it. Yeah. And do you know what? I, I expect them to get out of it now. I really do. I think Southampton and Leicester are in big, big trouble. I was really surprised we'll come on to the game. Obviously, Everton getting beat at home off Fulham because Daishi doesn't normally concede three goals at home in that kind of game. Um, but I would still expect Everton to just about have enough to get it over the line. Um, Forest, obviously, they're on such a poor, poor run. You can't see them getting enough. Yeah. And the bottom teams now, you know, they're, they're going to have to do something they've not done in seven games, they've only won five or six between them already. They're not going to win another three or four. Mm. The stats will not back that up. I think Forrest have got to stick with it. I agree Leicester changed far too late in the day. Um, but the bottom three as they are now would probably be my pick now. Cool. Yeah, let's have a look at the relegation zone. We've got three games to look at. Uh, we'll do that next. OK, let's do the relegation zone then. Uh, Watto spoke about Everton there. We're going to start at Goodison Park. Really surprising. 3-1 loss to Fulham. Having said that, Fulham have been brilliant this season. But no Mitrovic. I'd have fancied Everton to get something there. They have got a really tough run in Everton. I was looking at some of their fixtures. But I think traditionally you always look at it and go 40 points will keep you safe. I think it's been really interesting how low that points total is this year. I think you might stay up with, with, with 35 points. Um, you mentioned there, Watto, about Everton. Um, you think they'll just stay up just because it's Deitch? I think dicey has got the experience and the nous. I, I, I was really surprised that they got beat in that game. I think Silver going back to Everton, old club, he will have certainly wound his Fulham players up. But they are a good team. Mm. The, they've, they've outperformed themselves, if you like, this season. But you wouldn't expect him to go and get three goals at Everton the way Dicey sets up his teams. Um, I actually thought when Everton got back to 1-1, I thought it would be a, a different game. But Fulham are a really, really, really good football team. And it just shows you the level of the Premier League where Everton, home game at Goodison Park, fighting for their lives. They were real comfortable winners, Fulham. Really comfortable winners. And there are, again, we talk about coaching, tactics. They're a proper football team in, in, in what is the best league in the world with ultimately a really good manager. Yeah. He changed the system as well, didn't he? He'd have that three in midfield um, and then he went to a two. I don't know if that was sort of like because Mitrovic is out, I thought it could be a bit more expansive. But defensively, it was just so shot. Like that third goal, like Dan James turned into like Dennis Burkham, 98. He brought the ball down, it took a little nick, but we won't mention that. And it was 3-1, so I just... That was the, that's the big worry, isn't it? Because you think Dyche, defensive, stability, he's got it all there, but conceding three at home to Fulham, I mean, we've said stinks quite a few times, that whiffs. I think, I think the competitive nature of the Premier League plays into some people's hands because I think in, in, in different seasons, Everton could be really in trouble, but because there's so many yeah. teams that are worse than them. It's a bit like United in the top four race. I think if Chelsea and Liverpool had been more stable this year, it would be a harder yeah. top four race. But because you're up against Spurs, Newcastle, no disrespect to them, but it just it's the same with the relegation battle. It's, it just gives you that little bit of leeway that I probably agree that Everton will stay up. But... Wolves beat Brentford 2-0. Uh, uh, again, I mean, it's a very similar sort of game. Everton against Fulham, Wolves against Brentford. Relegation sides at home against two teams really having good seasons. But Wolves did get the job done. Uh, very good performance. You don't like them either? I don't mind them. I won't say too much. They just, 
and the journalists <laughs> knocking about. But yeah, great to see Diego Costa scoring. I mean, when he joined, looked like he was turning a caravan, didn't he? He'd had a few good summers, mm. but now he's back firing, looks fit. And he's he's just that sort of galvanising figure up front, isn't it? Where if, if you're in a lull, I imagine he puts a challenge in, get everyone up. And if you can get Molyneux Rocket, oh, actually, I'm not going to be going to that. That's too far. I don't want to give too much credit to Wolves. 2,115 days since his last goal, Costa. Wow, his that's first goal that's... of the season. So he had had a good summer. He'd had a few good summers there. But... <laughs> Well that's, well, that's what it is in the relegation battle. You've got to win your home game. Got, You'd be surprised about Everton, but Wolves did it, and that probably pretty much keeps them up. I think they're nearly there, yeah. yeah. I, I'm a bit like you. I think um, the points tally... I, if I were in any of these clubs, I'm aiming for 35. Yeah. I, I've got to get to 35. I'd be lucky if I what stay up. What did we have when we went down, what, in 2008? That was, that was a close one, wasn't it? There was about four or five teams in there. Yeah, we ended up... I'm not 100% sure, but I think it was maybe 35, yeah. yeah. 36, maybe. Mm. But I think the numbers have got less and less. You start the season, you say, look, 40, 40 points. Then 40. you go, let's go point a game, 38. But you look at the table now, I think 36, you're, you're, you're home and dry. But that means, like, for a, um, a Southampton and a, a, a Leicester, they've got to win three or four games. You've only won six yeah. all season. You've got to win 50% of your games. Yeah, uh, the stats are not going to back you up on that one. Um, but going back to the facts, Wolves have to win that game at home. I think Brentford uh, were a little bit below par. You know, Tony uh, obviously got a lot of issues off the field, maybe not quite firing, although he hit the post late on. I would never, certainly in his pomp, wanted to play against Costa. It's been <laughs> such a surprise that it's taken him that long and he were a bit of a lucky finish, if you like. But I think he's a real handful on his day. He's got fit now again. And again, I think a really good managerial recruitment. Yeah. You know, you go for a guy who's managed in top level in Spain, international manager, that's what the league is. I think it's the competitive nature of it. I mean, you've mentioned the summer, but this time of the season, you'd expect Everton, Fulham would be mid-table safe on the beach, um, you know, Brentford on the beach, Crystal Palace on the beach, but there is no mid-table team. There might be some now, I think you could probably say Crystal Palace are, but for most of the season... We never really had a mid-table team, so every game's so competitive. So you don't get these games at the end of the season where if you're fighting relegation or the title, you can go, they're on the beach there, or they're mentally not there and we're there. Every game is so competitive. And as we saw at uh, Southampton, 10th home loss of the season, a worse Premier League record. Um, I mean, look, look they're, they've, they've, they're gone. They've got to be gone, haven't they? I mean, Crystal Palace, nine goals in these first three games, Roy Hodgson. as he has got three and three. They're playing like prime Barcelona. I don't know what he's been doing in retirement, Roy, but uh, it was just men against boys, absolutely dominant stuff. Yeah, I think uh, the, the thing we spoke about off cameras was about that like Crystal Palace knew this run of games was coming up, so it'd be interesting to see if Vieira could have done what Roy's done. I think when Roy got, and you'll know a lot more why, but we all thought defensive structure, get it organised, but like you said, this free-flowing football, I'm not used to seeing it under Roy. No, I think, look, um, I agree. I think the fixtures have suited Roy and Ray going in, but they are what they are. I spoke to him when he got the job and congratulated him and um, he said to me that they were a better group of players now than when he left. So with the coaching that he gives them and the feel, um, sometimes you wouldn't expect all the, the free-flowing stuff, but they've won three games on the spin. They're safe, for, mm. for, for sure. He'll not ease up on the team in terms of the way he'll work and the training in the week. But they'll look a proper football team again. They're galvanised. Roy's that kind of guy. He likes taking the sessions. He get Players love him. He's that kind of guy. He's, he's obviously high standards, very demanding. But players love him. They know what's respect, expected. He manages the group well. And they're a good team mm. with good players. And they've got the bounce. But again, they've brought in an international manager and a guy that's managed thousands of games mm. because that's what's required at this level. You cannot come in and not have certain credentials to get your team over the line. Yeah, Coaching, that's what it's all come down to, isn't it? Well, I think also just touching on Southampton, it ties in a little bit to Everton as well. There's a lot of rumours like, oh, they need a little trip to the Championship, sort themselves out, get re-galvanised and go again. Well, if you go down to the Championship... It is an absolute minefield. I'm a 12-year veteran. I'm a lifer, probably. We're never going to get out. But if you go down there, there's just no guarantee, is there? It, it's a bum fight. And for, for all fans, we'll say that. And you, you're just clinging on to something that we can get some positivity if we go down. Instead of winning six games a season, we might win 15. Come on, let's, let's be honest. There's no team in that Premier League is ever going to say that 
going down, he'll kickstart and regal. Yeah. It, it's utter non. It's bullshit. It's nonsense. And if you get into that situation, whatever the better assets you've got are gone. Yeah. And again, you talk about recruitment again. Where do you go as a manager for Southampton? He's only signed till the end of the season. He's only done what? He's, by the time he's finished at the end of the season, he'll have managed twelve games, mm. and they're expecting on a third change to keep him up. Um, but I, I wouldn't recommend anybody going down to that championship and expecting to get up. It's it, it is really tough. They're absolutely down, Southampton. If they stay up, I'll wear a Man City shirt on the football filling and that's never going to happen. I mean, that might galvanise them, that might inspire them, but ultimately... That's the one chance they've got. That's the one chance they've got. They're they're gone. I mean, they're absolutely terrible. And 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 to be fair, it's football. They deserve to go down. Um, Anyway, me and Watto might be like Southampton now because we're up against uh, Stato, which is Will, in the quiz. It's time for the football filling quiz. God, God, we're up against God. God. Okay, it's time for the football filling quiz. That means the quiz master, Jamie, is in his seat and he's ready to go. How are we doing, Jamie? Yeah, I'm all good. I'm all good. You ready? Uh, well, ready I, I think we're going to get smashed, but we're, we're ready. No, no, no. no. Ten Everyone, questions. Calm down a sec. He's looking very relaxed in that corner. Yeah. Ten questions. <laughs> Arthur Finger first. Um, let's go. Who is Aston Villa's most expensive signing of all time? Dean Saunders. No. Philip Coutinho. No. Got all the time in the world, why? Yeah, I know, I've got to really think. It's like, Villa comes out of your memory, I've got to get yeah, into I it. Have it's, got be, it's got to be recent, yeah. hasn't it, actually thinking. I'm going to have to have time. Five, Did we get four, another crack? three. No. I know two, it one. It's the midfield. Danny Ings. No, it's not, it's not Ings. No, it's, no. What's the midfield name I'm thinking? I can't tell you the answer. <laughs> you can now. Uh, Buendia. Oh. Yeah. Never From Norwich. Been. How much? Yeah, forty-four point six million. Oh, yeah, never would have got that. Yeah, good job I didn't get that one. I wasn't thinking of him. No. <laughs> Next question. Question two: What club did Jose Mourinho manage before he joined Real Madrid in twenty ten? Inter. Inter. That's the correct answer. One nil. Goldbridge. Question number three: James Rodriguez is now a free agent, but what club was he just at? Al Naziri. Nope. Al Qatari. Nope. Is there another team over, over there? Al, 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 Al. Oh, I don't know. No, I don't know the names of the team. Not, not gonna definitely play a guitar, go. wasn't he? Yeah. No, it's Olympiakos. Olympiakos? Oh, oh. Yeah. Okay. I've heard of them. Yeah. <laughs> we have Question, good questions, here. they are good questions, these. Who scored the only goal in the 2021 FA Cup final? Um, Hint, Chelsea lost. Yeah, I know. I know who won it. I can't think who it was. I can't think who scored. Um, oh, yeah, it's Arsenal. For anybody who wants a hint. Yeah, we got. I got that bit. Right. Um, Giroud. No. Jesus. No. He weren't even there. Oh my uh, god. I turned it off after seventy minutes. It's not Arsenal, by the way. It's not Arsenal. It's not Arsenal. <laughs> oh, you can't help him, aren't <laughs> eh? Get that off. You, you can't have it. You can't have it. You, he uh, thinks it's Arsenal. Is it? Was it Liverpool? No. Nope. Nope. No. Nope. Nope. Who won the game? Kinemans. It was Leicester. Oh! oh no. <laughs> well, why didn't you just Outside give us a nod? No one remembers that unless you'd have been Leicester. <laughs> no. <laughs> How many questions we had? Uh, we're on question five now. So it's one nil mark. One nil mark. <laughs> the question's too hard this week. I'm sorry, guys. They're good, though. Um, no, they are good. Come on. Harlan and Eze both scored two goals this weekend. Who was the only other player to do so? Watkins. Watkins is the correct answer. You're getting back, we're getting back. 2 nil, goal bridge. That's, it, no, I don't know. That's unassailable. Whatever. No, it's five to go. Wait, it's five to go. Come on. You've got five to go, yeah. This is, you're starting to get in my head like last time. <laughs> trying to make me take the what what, what, what are you kissing on your butt? I thought you were kissing your butt. No, I was having a little sniff at this <laughs> Little lucky sniff. Question six. It's a career path question. Oh, I, you're good at this. I'll rate this. Yeah. I have played for Shrewsbury Town, Manchester City. Joe what? Joe Hart, I think it was Will. Chef. I think it was Will. I couldn't split and I was... That, that was well quick. Will Brazier. Yeah, well, <laughs> sorry. Oh, Can you believe that? Yeah, oh, it was, I'm, I I'm sorry, why? No, it's all right, it's all right. I plus. know where favouritism lies in this room. <laughs> <laughs> He's really good at these. That's balanced out, that. Yeah. That's good. N- nil, two. Is that mono you got on there? Yeah, yeah. yeah nice bit of mono. Yeah. Who is Netherlands' all-time goal scorer? Van Nistelrooy. Depay. No. No. Oh! 
I would say it's got to be... Well, I'm just going to go with a guess, Burkamp. No. Van Persie. It's Robin Van Persie, but you don't get the point. Why Come I'm on, sorry. you've just told I'm him sorry. two teams and bloody <laughs> given him a thing. <laughs> We can keep going till we get it right. He's a chance. Come on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We've got three questions left. Very okay. strict. Three questions left. He is very strict. Who Who is currently on the longest winless streak Forest. in the Premier League? Nottingham Forest. So yeah, I'd have been on it. It'd have been level. Be if he give me that one, level. Two to go. Isn't Brighton, two questions Brighton, to go. Yeah. So the scores are one, two, yeah, one. I've been VAR'd by you, Jamie, today. Oh, I'm sorry. Terrible. Apologies. Which club was Bernardo Silva at before joining Monaco. Manchester City? Monaco. I I Monaco is the correct answer. 2-2-1? Two, 2-2-1. Two, one. Two, two, one. Come on, get this. 2-2-1. Two, two, I, I was a bit aggressive towards you there, Jamie. I'd like to apologise. It's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> Shouted right in your face. Well, you've got to do it I because it's the only way you get an answer. Monaco! <laughs> start Listen! A start a bad again. If you've got gloves on, it's a red card. <laughs> Final question. Who was the manager of Chelsea when they won the Premier League title in 2009 and 10? Ancelotti. And Ancelotti is the correct answer. Yes, come on! <laughs> three way ties. Yes, three way ties. Yes, yes, you have yes, to go yes. to a tiebreaker question. Hey, just think if you'd give me that Joe I'm a winner. <laughs> I'm a winner. <laughs> hey, that's your fault. Tiebreaker oh, question. I'm on the right hand side. It's lively, lively. It's come really on. lively now. Okay, so tiebreaker question. So you all get an answer. So it's the nearest. Oh, nearest oh, wins. All right, I'll relax. So, 521, Mike Dean. <laughs> no, it's not that. It's not that. I'm just going to relax and just take my time. I'm going to breathe okay, in. So you can all relax. So obviously, Robin van Persie was the Netherlands' all-time goal scorer. But how many goals did he score for Netherlands? You know, I, can I just make a point? Whoever goes first there doesn't win because the other one just goes one. No, no, <laughs> that's true. That's true. I've been I've been in this situation so I'm not three times anyway. before. I'm not going to so answer. So if we all don't answer, yeah. then we go to another question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Host answers first. No, I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. Guest answers first. Oh, Will. What, how many goals did Van Persie score for Holland? Uh, yeah, Netherlands, yeah. Stale, mate. <laughs> I'll, I'll go 45. OK, 45 first. I've got 49 in my head for some reason. OK. I've got 52 in my head. The answer is... 50. So, yeah! Oh, he's going to get 49. 49. Come on! One goal. Come on. One That's goal. what you get. 49. I don't know why I had 49 in my head. You did a little look then. I thought you were going to go on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> if you got on the nose again, the sight would have been rigged. That oh. is Disappointed. Disappointed. Are we going to just have a quick revamp just to see the Joe Hart one? Because I could have actually been a winner. No, no, we won't. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs> the football fill in. Goldbridge has won the threesome. Well done, Mark. Let's get in. Thanks everyone for watching. See you next week.